go off on your own line of flight to such an extreme degree that you're not orthodox or heterodox. You're just something that is completely illegible to the status quo. And it's an important distinction because, you know, if you want to be heterodox or you try to be heterodox, you're never going to be. You're just going to be kind of the inverse of of the status quo. You're going to be a kind of inverted conformist. You're endorsed by Jonathan Haidt as a heterodox thinker. And I think today maybe we can we can change some people's lives. We can help people to get a better grasp on what that is, how they can incorporate it into their own lives. Uh, what would you say is, is heterodox thinking? The first thing that heterodox thinking is not is trying to be heterodox. This is, I think, <laughs> you know, this is a this is a plague that that is is covering many, many people in Western culture today. Everyone wants to be a dissident. Everyone wants to be heterodox. And I, I think that this is um, a trap. I, I, I don't like this way of thinking at all. I, I don't think of myself as heterodox. I don't mind that that's your frame and that's how you're thinking about it. And you want to you want to pick that apart. We can analyze it for sure. But I, I've never thought about myself in those terms personally. And I think what you really want to do is you want to just basically go off on your own line of flight to such an extreme degree that you're not orthodox or heterodox. You're just something that is completely illegible to the status quo that that's how i think about it and it's an important distinction because you know if you want to be heterodox or you try to be heterodox you're never going to be you're just going to be kind of the inverse of of the status quo you're going to be a kind of uh inverted conformist in a way and mm. that, i think that's what you see across across the culture today especially online especially on places like twitter um it's all of this you know, contrarian signaling. Everyone wants to be a contrarian. Everyone wants to be, you know, all these different terms like dissident or heterodox. And yet, look at what they're doing. Look at what they're talking about. They all they all tend to circle around the same drain. <laughs> yeah. So, so for you then, it's it's about going way off on your own light of flight, as you put it, till you're till you're unrecognizable. That's how I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's how I kind of felt when I was digging into your stuff, because I would I would read old blog posts and I read new stuff and I would I would think. It, it's almost it, your your style is distinct, but it was almost like a, a bit of a different personality to be pulling on all these different things. There seemed to be um, a hard frame to put around it all to kind of gather it all together. Whereas most folks who are in the space of ideas, it's really clear to me. I, I know right away. Um, how how is that working for you as a professional? Well, you definitely do lose some uh, growth you lose some brand appeal and some brand. There's a real strategic element to having a very specific, you know, set of themes that you cover and being able to define yourself in a very clear way. There are clear advantages to that without a doubt. You, you just, you can grow faster on, on the public internet. You can build an audience and a following and, you know, open up for yourself certain standard paths, like being a, a speaker or a consultant or whatever, you know, um, so there are obvious and strong reasons why you would be um, focusing on presenting yourself in a certain way, and that's why most people do it. But you also there's a trade off as well because you 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 put yourself in a box. And I, I know a lot of people actually who build a brand on the internet quite big because they're like they represent something very specific. They go hard on that, and they're able to you know build build a large audience around it. But then they decide they're not interested in that topic anymore, at which point their audience is basically useless because they're all there for that specific thing. So you kind of can't go off the path. Uh, all those people will dislike it and, and they'll, they'll, they won't, they won't be there for it. Um, that's one problem. But another problem is if you get into hot water with your audience or, you know, you change your mind on something important and they start to, you know, consider you a traitor to the cause, then you can, you can basically find yourself um, unable to use the audience that you've built. I, I know people like this who, um, you know, people talk about audience capture. This is kind of a, a concept right now that people know about. Um, and it's kind of a known issue, but it's actually worse than that and, and more subtle than that in a way, because there are people who it's not that they've been captured by their audience. It's that they've been disowned by their audience. And those people can't even use, I know people who can't even use their Twitter account anymore because they got to like more than a hundred thousand followers on some topic. But then they then they kind of change their mind and now if they say anything on that Twitter account that's not in line they just get like tons and tons of hateful replies so they literally have just been pushed off of Twitter they can't use their Twitter account anymore so yeah I see I look out today and I see a lot of people 
over competing for these kind of standard paths, these these like highly articulated, defined uh, personal brands, because there is a lot of growth that you get out of that specificity. Um, but then I look at the history of ideas and the history of, of the arts, and I see a different um, approach that, that is also tried and true, which is, you know, it's just it's just the, 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 the wild man, the, the really, truly modest and humble position of, of going off the rails, not in a way that is splashy necessarily, not in a way that is for attention seeking, uh, but, but quite the opposite, literally just kind of exiting the grid of intellig intelligibility altogether. And you do that long enough, you go off on your own track, you do sacrifice growth in the short term, but uh, the way I read things empirically is that um, if you can stay consistent and focused and creative and productive for a long period of time, totally off the rails on your own line of flight over a long enough amount of time you're gonna you're gonna almost inevitably create something remarkable that you know in five years 10 years 20 years is going to be exceptional and undeniable that that, that people won't be able to you know look away from on, on some level mm -hmm. that's what i think anyway i'm not saying at all that i've accomplished that or that i'm anywhere near it but that is my how i see my trajectory and and the kind of model that i'm trying to operate on what would be some of the models that you found, he said, in history, the arts, that sort of thing? There, there's kind of a subterranean uh, tradition, if you will, that, that I have always kind of been most inspired by. I can just give you a few examples. Um, like I said, I, have, I haven't thought about this recently, so it's not top of mind. But, you know, I looked at someone like Diogenes, the cynic, um, Diogenes of Sinope, who was, you know, uh, a, a wild Greek philosopher in ancient Greece. He was... Basically, uh, the first performance artist, he would uh, basically live out of a barrel with dogs, kind of almost like a homeless person. Um, but he was educated and, and articulate. And then he would go on and do kind of public performances like he was known once for like walking around in broad daylight with a lamp. Um, and people would ask him like, hey, what are you doing? Uh, looks a little strange. And he would say, I, I'm looking for a man. He was basically a, a, a kind of like brutal critic of like all currently existing kind of bourgeois norms basically and uh, and he and he, he aimed to uh, kind of reveal the hypocrisy of, of all of normal society by living in um, an incredibly like uh, orthogonal way that just kind of didn't make sense to people and he would he would kind of purposely be um, uh, do things that 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 didn't did not uh, parse kind of the contemporary sensibilities at the time to force people into, you know, kind of reevaluating themselves or, or, or reevaluating society at the time. Other examples are like, you know, Rousseau, I, I've always been struck by the life of Rousseau. Rousseau is, you know, a very, very wild, wild man, a really provocative guy, obviously kind of comes up in uh, Calvinist Geneva, uh, very small town, very uh, conservative in a way, but also, you know, this early, early enlightenment and, um, he was really a kind of uh, anti-enlightenment en enlightenment. You know, the people like Voltaire uh, and, and Diderot are kicking around at the time preaching these philosophies of, you know, science and reason and are, are going to produce progress and, you know, let's liberate the arts and sciences. And Rousseau basically comes out and says, you know, all all of all of creative and intellectual life is is. Uh, degenerate essentially and we would be better off if, if we if we didn't do all of this stuff um, so uh, but was he, he basically spent his life on the run Rousseau Rousseau um, you know literally was hopping around European country to European country because um, you know the, the the kings and queens of the time were, were after him for, for various um, reasons to, related to his you know provocative beliefs and teachings and and so these type, these are the types of people that I think about the most. Uh, you know, also someone like Nietzsche or Emerson, kind of the more, um, you know, post-academic or para-academic. Of course, Nietzsche was a was a academic philologist, and then kind of defected from the institutions. Obviously, went off as what went off on his own path uh, to the point of driving himself mad. Someone like Emerson was a well-trained Unitarian minister, and as soon as he enters the ministry essentially, you know, kind of gets canceled, what we would call today canceled uh, for his like provocative free thinking. And then he just basically leaves the ministry altogether and, and becomes a kind of independent intellectual who does speaking tours um, to, and, and sells books to, to make money. And so, um, you know, I see all of these characters as 
you know, in their own way from different angles, representing uh, this kind of subterranean lineage that, that I'm interested in. And what they all basically have in common is being like uh, very weird and provocative in ways that don't really parse in the short term, but then sticking to that, sticking to their guns, going on the run, being creative and ingenious with uh, how they actually organize their life just to make the production of their work sustainable over time. They have to get very creative and very resourceful um, to do that against like all of the social and economic uh, incentives that that they're that they're really pushing against but they 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 hold fast they keep working over the long term and then you know by the end of their life they have uh, really uh, created an extraordinary and exceptional and unique body of work uh, even though you know they 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 very much had to go on this long uh, journey through the desert as it were on on their own path to to, to produce that body of work so I'm not sure that those are the best examples, but those are some that I, I like the most. So you have these these guiding lights and these examples. What do you think is the is the inertia that you're that you're resisting, or that, that many people are resisting? Is it is it the school system? Is it the social media algorithms? Is it human nature? Um, what is it that keeps us more toward uh, conformism? Well, there's certainly a lot in human nature that makes us highly conformist creatures for sure without a doubt i mean we're just very social and and being being a social creature essentially means being a conformist creature and, and it's not necessarily even a bad thing i don't i don't i don't you know i don't i don't like try to have too much contempt for for conformists it, it's just it is human nature and and it's quite um adaptive and reasonable for most people i mean trying to think about everything from first principles and uh, develop your own theory of the world is actually a pretty ludicrous and, and ridiculous uh, venture. And in some ways, it's it's a kind of idiotic venture. And I mean, idiotic in, in the kind of technical sense of, you know, being like a babbling um, uh, idiot who, who kind of mumbles to himself the, these like strange uh, conceptions. So it's like, um, I, I'm quite sympathetic, actually, to Rousseau, who, who kind of sees in this intellectualist calling um, actually like the, the seeds of, of everything that would become wrong with modern society in a certain way. So, you know, there's a certain wisdom to conformity and there's a certain there's a very, very, uh, you know, reasonable element to it. But without a doubt, everything, everything defaults to conformity. We get our ideas from other people. We get our sense of what is possible from others. It's um, highly socially uh, disruptive, really, to have like truly unhinged independent uh thoughts or ideas or proposals you're constantly going to be saying things that really do tear at the fabric of what holds us together what holds us together is like you know saying nice things to each other and white lies and and papering over you know the the glaring uh horrifying <laughs> realities of of like the human condition right so it's like um i definitely wouldn't uh, ha, you know, ex express condescension for for conformity because it is it is by by and large it, it is how we get on as, as a society. Um, but you know, if you want to do some, it, you know, some people feel called to try to figure things out, and for those people, you know, conformity is is the greatest pitfall. But yeah, I'd say it's mostly human nature, um, and you know, psychology and sociology, which are really just kind of derivatives of of human nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said that white lies are, are part of a, the thing that, that holds us together. Um, how, how is that? I, my first instinct is, is that lies um, create a sort of division um, and, and would be counterproductive. But I'm, I'm curious what you think. Sure. Well, by that, I just mean nothing too technical, but just that, you know, we agree to paper over certain things to get on with to get mm -hmm. on with life. Basically, you know, if we if we if we try to litigate every interpersonal you know discrepancy we would spend we would waste a lot of time doing that and we would have much more conflict and, and less cooperation than than we do and so but i mean okay this is not really interesting so let me try to get interesting for your for your audience i mean um you know if you read someone like uh norbert elias uh you know the history if you look at like the history of of of, of bourgeois manners you actually look at how things like etiquette and manners like actually arose like what defines kind of the modern uh sophisticated bourgeois um, attitude that that 
you would distinguish from the uncivilized brutes of you know the the pre-modern era the you know the the you know the the dirty guys who ate with their hands more or less like animals right like what someone like norbert elias uh studies this he calls it the civilizing process and when you look at like how people went from this kind of like pre-modern medieval almost like uh chimp like you know uh warrior uh person uh who has no manners has no sense of of politeness or um you know culture and you and you look at how that evolved into you know the 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 courtly societies of of you know like you know the aristocratic um you know 18th century or 19th century he argues that it is essentially at its core a kind of lying process like manners themselves are the lies we tell on top of our disgusting repulsive <laughs> animal nature you know what i mean and so it's like um you know it's like so in a way eating with like eating with a fork is kind of like a little white lie it, it, it's, it's a lie over the fact that in fact we are animals who would quite like to eat with our hands but 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 we we defer that and we use this fork because it looks a little bit more polished it distances us from our horrifying animal nature you know even things like going to the bathroom to uh like going to a separate room to use the bathroom in a way that's lying right it's like it's 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 telling the dinner party that we don't do these disgusting things that we all know that we all do right um and so, yeah, if you, so so it, I guess it is somewhat interesting if, if you want to double click on that and, and look at that, because on some level, like modern, you know, sophisticated, rational, uh, you know, sentiments and behaviors are all kind of deeply rooted in lies that we want to tell ourselves about what we're not when, in fact, we, we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned that we, we don't need to litigate every little discrepancy because of some of this. You have an interesting uh, piece that you've written that suggests something along the lines of that there's kind of an equation of, of how much energy it takes to solve problems between people that basically, you know, one hour over a beer works for someone you're close with. But, you know, if you're not that close with someone, it takes it takes more time. Um, what What is that that sort of idea about litigating things and how our pre-existing relationships affects that? Right. So, I, I mean, I guess the reason why this is interesting or important is that we are increasingly finding it comfortable and efficient to talk with and cooperate with very specific pockets of society while we're finding it increasingly time consuming and, and difficult to talk with and negotiate with most of the rest of society. And so there's basically this uh, general trend where we're seeing culture itself fragment. And I think I wrote about this at one point um, because it really changes one's expectations around like where the future of, you know, social creativity, social institutions are actually going to be generated from. And so historically, you know, we today index to kind of the, you know, the 20th century, let's say that's kind of very broadly, you know, most of what we have in our mind when we think about like what society is, we, we've, we have this kind of picture of what a society is based on our recent history. And, and so, a lot of the institutions that most of us imagine constitute society. We think of, you know, the big businesses. We think of the the big media. We, you know, we think of the government. We think of these. We think of the military. We think of these kind of big molar institutions, basically, that we imagine. In most of our minds, we have this kind of cartoon in our mind where, like, society is this like big thing. There's a few big, you know, tents in it. The media, the universities, the the, the government. And we imagine that this is the source of, you know, like social leadership. And it seems increasingly clear to me that that is no longer true. And it's less and less true every year. And the reason is because it was only under very specific and, and relatively contingent circumstances that we could all kind of make believe that we're all members of one nation, right? If you look at something like the United States, you know, this like idea that, you know, everyone works for a company, we work for a company our whole lives, we're a company man, we have a union, we're gonna have uh, social security checks coming from the government, we're gonna have, you know, all of these like big 
uh, shared expectations around uh, our role that we play in like a relatively small number of institutions. I mean, one by one, all of those things are 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 being depleted. Basically, obviously, things like union membership are down, uh, but. Also, you're seeing more and more people basically exit all of these. There's like this mass exodus of energy and creativity leaving all of these large institutions, and they're all splintering in, in, in a variety of different ways. And this is across the board. And so that's why I was writing about that, and that's why that point is interesting or, or important. It's just to see that you know, if you wanted to build a business or build an organization of any kind or do anything at all meaningful with – someone down the street from you who you don't have any, you know, um, shared conceptual framework with, it's actually harder to do now than it's ever been because of those kind of psychological cognitive costs have become so great. The words that we use are also different. Uh, we all watch different things. We all listen to different things. We all read different things. Uh, the, the actual meaning of basic words is different for different people now. And so it's like for me to go down the street and knock on a random guy's door, he could be my age, he could be, he could look like me, he could even have a relatively, you know, similar background as me. And the words that that guy uses to think about the world and to understand the world, the, wor the words that to him represent reality are most likely going to be so different from mine that it would take us months of getting to know each other to even be able to imagine, to, to be able to verbalize and conceptualize some sort of potentially shared product. Uh, or project or, or vision, let alone let alone to actually trust each other and be you know on the same page enough to move forward with it. And so this is just I think the reason I was talking about that and and the, the point that I was analyzing is that you know people today still imagine that there's going to be some kind of like restructuring of some reconstitution of like mass society. You hear you read any book today. This is a massive bias in like pretty much all published books, like all books that come down from big publishers almost all have this like weird archaic bias where like the beginning and final chapters will always say something to the effect of like, this is how we need to restore trust or this is how we need to fix this. There's like this – people still refer to this mass we that is no longer there whatsoever um, and – Yes, to really to really understand that you have to kind of think through how the how the costs of even communicating have increased substantially across these different fragmented pockets. And so, um, yeah, that's why I see a future where you're only going to see, you know, new things built and created and sustained by extremely narrow pockets of intensely aligned uh, individuals and, and to a degree that I think is still like vastly underrated. So what are we talking about here? Is this like um, like Balaji's uh, nation state uh, or what is it? Network state sort of idea. I, I know you had a lot of discussions with folks in this Web3 space. Is it is that your vision? Yeah, I think the network state concept is is a very illuminating one. It's a it's a great piece of rhetoric and it really does kind of name and point to something uh, potentially quite substantial and, and very much so it, it reflects what I'm saying here. It's very much. Uh, a kind of theoretical conception that is strongly um, based on or aligned with 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 the phenomenon I'm I'm describing here for sure. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that, and I do think that at the limit of what I'm describing, you will see what are essentially more or less sovereign uh, countries. I, I you know I think what exactly is a country is you know that's going to change a bit, and uh, perhaps that's an interesting question. Um, but it's going to what you're going to see come out of this sort of thing is going to be closer to a country than the the things that we currently call call these various things. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm quite interested in that. And I, I, I do I do think that. What do you think about um, perhaps a, a different thesis that there are historical cycles and we tend to you know fracture and then we tend to link back together after periods of crisis you know in I mean, anglo-american society i mean we've had the revolutionary war we've had the civil war we've had world war ii and perhaps now we're in a similar crisis and then we'll see a bonding after it's possible but i mean cycles are cycles are pretty hard to find in history like to show to really show def, you know convincingly long-term cycles and it's hard um it's not you know on some intuitive level it kind of sounds really nice and it does sound sensible um and maybe there are some cyclical patterns but 
but they're but they're pretty hard to show and um so that's one one thing but the other thing is that i think the more relevant observations are actually relatively long-term secular trends you know so it's like if you look from modernity to today it, it seems like the fragmentation i'm describing has been happening with an accelerating degree since roughly you know the 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 advent of modernity you know the 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 protestant reformation for instance is a kind of splintering of the established church and there has been since you know the 1500s a uh, continual gradual splintering and splintering and splintering of the splinters <laughs> all the all the way downstream over time from the initial protestant Re reformation so yeah i think you know you're I, so i so i actually tend to think that cyclical mental models understate the gravity of of, of what's happening because I, I do think in many ways we are actually um looking at accelerating long-term processes then back to this idea of ideas splintering or having a more orthodox view um how do you spot when you're getting into a sort of conforming orthodox way of thinking and kind of check yourself well usually you feel gross basically you know you mm -hmm. feel you, you, most people, when they're just saying something to, to conform, uh, they feel it pretty quickly as a kind of um, anxiety around, you know, will they be will they fit in? Will they be accepted? Will it be believed? Will it be bought? You know, it's like whenever you're speaking or writing anything and, and you kind of have this um, anxiety in you of like, are they going to like it? You know, are, are they going to, are they going to buy this? Are they going to, are they going to like me? Are, are the cool kids going to let me at their table when they see this? You know, almost everyone has that kind of petty childish, you know, over socialized kind of super ego in, in their mind when, when they're speaking or writing things. And that's always like the, one of the, the best, you know, indicators that, that you're conforming and that you're um, basically just doing, you know, kind of social social labor uh, to to maintain group group ties or group alliances or your status within a particular group. In my experience, it's like you know, you the feeling is pretty clear um, because you 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 also te it tends to be correlated with just generally feeling kind of gross. You know, if you have any if you have any kind of calling to to conscience or calling to you know. To try to to try to tell the truth about things. If you're the type of person who's called in that way at all, then you're going to feel kind of gross whenever you're you know kowtowing. Um, and on the contrary, when you are really breaking free and you're really trying to name something or describe something um, accurately and and as honestly as possible, you have uh, often a feeling of you know, risk, there's a little nervousness, but, uh, you know, there's a little bit of like, oh, you know, am I going to get in trouble for this? You know, <laughs> uh, you should feel that a little bit. You should always feel that a little bit. Um, but, but you'll, but it, the overwhelming feeling is usually just like kind of contentment and satisfaction with one's own mind, right? Like the, you know, when, when you're really just telling the truth in a disinterested way and you're, and you're working on what you should be working on in your own way, you just feel at peace. You just feel like um, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just saying what I'm supposed to be saying, and that's that's the feeling you you always want you always want to kind of um, have to know that you're on the right path. I think anyway, mm -hmm. but but it's always tinted a little bit with like a kind of pleasurable devilishness, like a little pleasurable <laughs> like oh this this is this is a little spicy. You want that you want that feeling. It's it's a good sign, I think. Yeah. So for you, what would be maybe an example of of when you felt that that grossness and when you felt that pleasurable devilness or well, devilishness yeah i mean definitely definitely when i was an academic there were there mm -hmm. was a lot of there was a lot of time in my life too much time in my life where i just you know had that kind of icky sinking feeling of like i'm just saying words because these are the words you're supposed to say to get on in this in the situation that i'm in um and again, this is like the norm, most normal thing ever. So it's not, I'm not even criticizing academia. Like I don't, academia is fine. Academia is like all m mainstream, large bureaucratic institutions. Like 
it's, it's white lies from top to bottom. That's how our society gets on. It's, so it's, this is not a big critique or attack on on academia. This is all large modern institutions. Uh, but yes, I, I frequently felt that that gnawing feeling, that sinking feeling of just being a kind of weak cog in a machine saying words, not to say things, not to express things, not to not to name interesting, difficult things that I see or feel, but just saying words, almost like passwords, just to unlock like the next step in like the the bureaucratic power process. Basically, it's like every word is just a code word um, in this like big system of of words that isn't really about saying anything true. It's about the words are just like these symbols for internal power play, basically. Yeah, so I felt that a lot, and yeah, and, and it wears on you. It's it, it, it's gross, um, but also very normal. And you know, some people just that that's that's just that that's the work they do. And uh, for some people, it's worth it. Like for some people, you know, the the mission of the organization or the mission of the the institution or the bureaucracy is noble, and they believe in it. And and to those people, I, I have no I have no problem with those people. You know, it's like they see they see themselves as like you know saying these words with each other. Um, to to accomplish some larger goal that that's worth while and, and and valuable. If that's how you feel, then then all those little white lies are fine. All those little white lies are for for that person. They feel fine. They feel like they're just doing, you know, they're cooperating and 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 producing something larger. And in the, in that context, words are just tools for that. Um, but like I said, if you if you if you if you are called to a vocation of using words to to express truths and to advance, you know, how, how we understand things in, uh, in, in fundamentally novel and, and more accurate ways, then I think you can't settle with that. And so what are some examples of, you know, feeling that, that, that correct feeling? Well, um, I, I try to feel it every, I try to feel it every day or every week, at least, you know, just reading, writing to me, it's like, it's mundane. It's not, it's not, and this is what I was saying before about like, you know, you don't want to try to be heterodox and you don't want to try to be a dissident, which is always it's a, it's always a counterproductive LARP like that feeling of, you know, thinking the truth and, and, and penetrating, you know, the the confusion and the ideology of everyday life. You should be able to access that on a daily basis. It's if you're just reading good books, uh, writing in your journal, even doing any doing any kind of private, thoughtful uh, study and reflection. You should. It, it's a relatively mundane. It should be a relatively common and mundane feeling of of, of joy and intrigue and and you know um, self like self consistency basically um, and and illumination. So like I said, it's not. Yeah, it's it's not too. Um, I, I don't want to make it sound too special or rare or impressive. Is there a maybe not special or rare, but a, a juicy moment that you had where you thought. Ooh, I'm I'm on to that good feeling right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I guess you're probably alluding to like some of my my nuclear tweets or whatever, which I guess I've had a few of. Um, yeah, sure. Like you know, sometimes sometimes you chance upon with social media today, it's like these these massive social conveyor belts, you know. So it's like um, this massive social machine, and sometimes you have a little thought or observation, and you're just kind of like, uh, this is like a Molotov cocktail for the <laughs> for the for the for the conformist hive mind. And yeah, sometimes sometimes you get sometimes you get those little Molotov cocktail gems, and you're like, yeah, I'm just gonna like, I'm just gonna throw this grenade into the conformist, um, you know, society and watch it explode. Yeah, and sometimes that happens, uh, and usually, and every so often when it happens, I, I actually do have a pretty good predictive sense. Like I kind of know that this is uh, this is gonna be a good one, and yeah. that's fun. Yeah, I, I do enjoy that. I won't lie, I, I, I take great pleasure in that. I do. My wife doesn't though. My wife doesn't though. So it's uh, that's that's my that's my real constraint, to be honest. What are practices that that keep stimulating this part of you? Is there a particular way that you choose the material that you interact with when you pick what you read, um, or is there um, some other process in your writing or something that helps you to keep this fresh? I think choosing what to read it, it very much is just on this um, on this criterion that I articulated earlier, just about you know looking for. I mean, I'm always just looking for freedom. I'm looking for an exit. I'm looking for weapons. You know, I'm looking for joy, like any anything, basically like anything that lights me up. I, again, I think like, so, you know, Spinoza says that uh, joy 
is the experience of one's own power increasing essentially. And, uh, you know, there's this very interesting book by a neurobiologist named Antonio Damasio called looking for Spinoza. And it's all about how uh, Spinoza way before modern neuroscience pretty much had correctly identified certain, um, now well demonstrated kind of scientific processes and, that 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 idea about joy is one of them and so you want you want to find things that give you joy and and joy is not happiness exactly it's not like some kind of saccharine you know um some some saccharine sense of like oh the world is perfect and and i'm i'm smiling it's it's very it's a very specific uh emotional phenomenon where you feel that your capacities are being expanded so, like most good books will should make you feel more powerful in that way and and just i try to always just go towards the themes and the things that um tend to give me that feeling of of of, of joy like technically understood mm -hmm. i wonder how you know when you've pushed far enough or when maybe you're pushing too far um there's a quote it's, it's attributed to chesterton i think and i'm probably going to butcher it but it's something like you want to you want to open your mind kind of like your mouth. You, you want to be able to, to, you know, let things in, but then you want to close down on something solid. Um, yes. You don't want your brain to fall out. So how do you right. know when you've kind of pushed that line far enough and you're not just out on things that are wacky? Right, right. Well, yeah, you do need, you do need constraints. You know, if you, if you, if you try too hard to go freedom maxing, you will actually just burn out and become dissolute like so so yeah you can't you can't just um unidimensionally max out freedom or liberty or something like that because then you just be you would just it would, it would be like nonsense right or you would just be like constantly saying anything almost right so you need constraints and i tend to think that you know there are there are a few a few very important specific forms of constraint that are, I think, you know, very productive and, and necessary and useful. I mean, one is obvious, it's just reality itself. And this is what, you know, scientific method essentially boils down to is, you know, you do have to hold yourself accountable to objective reality. Uh, roughly, if you're talking about empirical processes, there is, you know, one specific, well understood, deeply, you know, articulated, and modeled protocol for doing that. And it, and it is called the scientific method. The scientific method is the protocol whereby we hold our empirical models to reality itself. Um, so that's constraint number one um, that, you know, uh, of course, if you're an artist or spinning fictions or whatever, you can certainly, obviously you can, you know, depart from that. But if you want to, you know, try to tell the truth about how the world works. That's the first constraint. And it's a significant, it's a substantial, substantial constraint. It, it basically rules out the overwhelming majority of things you could possibly say. Right. Um, and, and only leaves, you know, quite a, quite a number of things you could still say, but it rules out quite a lot. Um, so that's one of the first most important. Um, another one though, is obviously, you know, um, some sense of ethics. I'm a religious man myself. I tend to think that you don't really get a strong ethical um, backstop without some form of religious faith. That, that's, a, that's a view I hold. Other people, you know, see it differently and not everyone has to agree. But I do, I do tend to think that ultimately um, faith is a kind of inescapable um, requirement for human beings to keep themselves on the rails. And I also tend to think it, it actually is, is rather intellectually productive and, and even creatively productive. You know, I think the ability to go off the rails in the ways that in the way that I've described, to, to use that expression almost as a technical term, uh, how, I, how I've laid it out today. Um, I, I, I find that faith historically is a very, very strong supporter of that kind of um, wholesome but, but radical intellectual and creative deviancy. Um, you know, you can cite examples all the way, you know, everyone from like uh, Kierkegaard to, to Kanye West today, right? Or yay, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> so um, I, I tend to think that faith is, is a very, very productive and creative uh, constraint that, that I tend to think personally is on some level unavoidable because it seems to me that even the most hard-nosed secular atheist 
rationalists um, tend to have some pockets of faith on some level, just from a just from like a kind of logical analysis. It seems like without some form of faith to backstop you, you you will get into problems of of kind of infinite regress. Um, so that's the second form of constraint that I I do think is important, but actually more creative than people think. A lot of people think religion and faith is like oppressive. I, I think it's almost exactly the opposite if understood correctly. And then, of course, I think the third is there is a correct and necessary and healthy form of constraint and even conformism at the level of one's one's loved ones. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. that this is an essential part of life. You do have to have some number of human human beings around you who you are accountable to, who you love, who you respect, and who you want to be happy and and for whom you will, you know, contain yourself somewhat, you know, and, um, you know, everyone has to kind of draw that that balance for themselves. But I mentioned my wife before, you know, my, yeah, my wife, my wife does not like when I have nuclear tweets. It's very and for most and most people wouldn't like it. Right. It's again, that's very normal. It's for most people. It's highly stressful, highly disruptive. Um, I had one, one of my most nuclear tweets was like on TV. It was like featured on TV, um, at at one point. And like, you know, we got, we were getting inbound messages from like distant family members, Mm -hmm. like concerned and stuff. So it's like, no one wants that. Of course that's stressful. Um, of course that's like highly disruptive. Um, and so, yeah, on some level, is that conformity? Is that conformism? Yeah, it is. But also it's like, you have to love people and you have to have, you know, there have to be people in your life who um, have different preferences than you, who have different, you know, um, baselines for like the amount of stress and 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 conflict, social conflict they they can tolerate. And you have to you have to you know embrace that as a healthy constraint. And and frankly, again, I think it's more productive and creative than than people realize because you like. I don't mind that to 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 honor my wife, to make my to keep my family healthy and happy and and stable. I don't mind that I can't literally that 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 prevents me from typing any random thing that comes <laughs> to my mind. It's just it's not that much of an it's not that oppressive of a constraint. And rather, again, I think it generates certain forms of of interesting idiosyncratic uh, creativity because then it becomes a matter of okay, well. My challenge is how can I say what I want to say in a way that that is good and respectful towards the people I love also, you know, so it's like a new constraint. It's a new and and ultimately, I think these forms of constraint make you they're the things that push you down a unique path in a way. That's that's another key thing is that, like, if you're just freedom maxing and you're just like, oh, I'm I'm the I'm the wildest dissident heterodox person ever. I say everything you're not allowed to say. I just say it one after another. Actually, you, you, you will pretty quickly kind of empty, empty your arsenal. You'll say all of the, you know, um, provocative things that are out there to be said. And actually you've just like, you've just become a relatively generic kind of like purveyor of, of, you know, spicy takes, you know what I mean? It's like, that's actually not that interesting. What, what's more interesting and meaningful in the long run is, you know, you see a couple of things that are maybe like not, you know, it's you see a few dangerous truths you see it, you see and you're interested in and you study some things that are a little a little spicy, a little a little, you know, disliked by normal society, a, a little dangerous. And you study them, you get to know them well. And you also find ways of articulating yourself and you find types of work th- that you can produce that 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 express those dangerous truths or dissident or heterodox ideas in a way that makes sense in your life story and makes sense to the people you know and does it in a way that your loved ones can respect or at least tolerate. That's going to actually put you – that's going to force you to be even more creative and even more thoughtful and ultimately even more unique and and in a way that is going to make for a real life story. It's going to make for a real deeper narrative, I think. And so, um, yeah, that's, these are things that I I think about a lot. And, um, I do think that you can, you, you can choose for absolute freedom, right? And some people do this, right? You can do like an anonymous avatar on Twitter, right? Where you're just like, 
any name and you make up a name, you make up a face and you're just like none of your friends and family know it's you and you just spew all your, <laughs> you know, you spew all your dissident heterodox ideas and you're a real unlimited provocateur. In my view, not many of those accounts like go very far. I don't think many of those accounts are going to be are going to make a real impact. I don't think um, they're going to build a meaningful body of work. And, and it's because of this thing that I'm describing. It's because you need those constraints. The, those constraints are what actually make a life, a human life, a meaningful, interesting uh, human life that that is worth knowing about, that is worth reading. And um, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. So within these constraints of reality, loved ones, and some form of faith, how do people then go about making a career like this? This is something that, that you've done. You seem to be uh, helping a lot of other people and building a community of thinkers like this. Um, how, how do you go from from being you know in institutions and living like that to being more out on your own, but still within these creativity inducing constraints? Yeah, it's a great question. I guess at this point, this is something I'm I'm kind of becoming known for, I guess. But this is what is so interesting now about the internet and about this this current stage of of the splintering of culture. It's like it's never been easier and cheaper and quicker and and more available to us to basically just spin up any number of weird, unique, creative little operations and just find somewhere in the operation you're running to insert a, a payment option, right? It's like a bit you know, it's like a business nowadays can mean so many things and there's so many ways you can basically just spin up a certain amount of cultural energy and create interesting stuff and valuable stuff for people. And you can just do this in like so interesting and creative ways that from the outside doesn't even necessarily look like a business. But um, if it's interesting or valuable or cool or any anything that people find, you know, uh, worthy of their attention, and worthy and 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 you know attractive to participate in you can you can basically design things however you want and just throw up yeah like i said a some sort of like payment model and you would be surprised how you know creative you can get and so this is you know what is euphemistically called like the creator economy right um you see it with you know you see certain specific patterns more more commonly than others obviously people know of podcasts who monetize through patreon or you know, different forms of, they're all different types of form, right? YouTubers earn a share of ad revenue through YouTube. There are, you, you can get sponsors on your newsletter. You can have a paid newsletter. There are all these kind of well-known patterns now. But the larger point is that, like, what, what what's really happening there, the more important general point of, of what's going on with all of that stuff that we're seeing is that basically – if you have interesting things to share, if you have real ideas, if you have true and novel ideas that are perhaps very, you know, uh, discouraged or even penalized in the, the old mainstream institutional society, you can just basically write them. You can say them, you can speak them, you can record them and you can put them out into the world. And as long as they're interesting enough or valuable enough or, um, you know, fascinating or, or inspiring or cool or all of these different types of things that can attract people to ideas and, and works of art and, and cultural, you know, outputs, as long as you can do meaningful work, um, you can find a way to charge a bit of money around it. And that's, that's the most important thing, you know, for thinking about the future of, of what you might call heterodox thinking like it's just obviously um it's just obvious to me that um if you want to think real and interesting things and you want to share them creatively and freely you're going to do it this way from now on it's just i mean it just seems like uh that's it's game over as far as far as i can tell i mean there's like i said there's still fine reasons to go into academia or to you know publish a book with like a big New York publisher, or even if they, you know, want to impose like very particular kind of narrow frames that you, you don't necessarily like or, or agree with or whatever. So there, I, I'm not, you know, throwing shade on people who still choose to do these things in the old world. But I, I think that the, their days are numbered. I just think it's going to, it's going to go away. And all of the most interesting stuff is going to be done on the outside, as it were, through these um, kind of very creative, weird, um, still being determined, um, you know, 
cultural economic formations that we're seeing today. And, you know, that's what I do myself. I've, I've, you know, I'd like to think of myself as something of, you know, one, one, I, I would see myself as something of a pioneer in just one specific dimension of that, which is the, you know, the, the, the defecting professor who basically continues doing everything he was doing as a professor, but on the internet, which I've managed to figure out how to do through a lot of experimentation and, and, and just playing around with yet different ways of, of, of piecing these things together. Uh, but of course, you're seeing it across the board in, in, in many verticals. You see New York Times journalists quitting to do a sub stack and so on. It's all the same trend. It's all the same, um, you know, gradient in, in contemporary history. So that I, I'm, I'm just 100 percent convinced that that's that's the future of the intellectual life, at least the, like the most interesting elements of the intellectual life moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, Justin, for people who want to see how you're navigating all that, uh, before I ask my last question, where should people look for you online? Yeah, sure. I would just send people to my newsletter. That's kind of the centerpiece of everything that I do. The Other Life newsletter, just otherlife.co, otherlife.co. So, uh, uh, yeah, people can check check it out there. And I do other things like the podcast and YouTube and stuff, but it's easiest to find out about that just through the signing up to the newsletter. Great. We'll put links to that in the description for people to check out. And uh, Justin, my last question is, you know, we talk about a lot of this being intellectually stimulating for you and everything. Um, what do you hope that your audience gets from reading your work? Hmm. Good question. I'm just trying to think if there's something other than the, the obvious feel good answer, which is just, um, you know, the obvious feel good answer is just to say that, yeah, I do want people to see that there is this subterranean spirit of of authentic uncontrollable ungovernable and and independent kind of existentially independent uh spirit of 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 thinking and writing that is accessible to everyone and and and, and kind of everyone knows that they could do a little bit better to try a little bit harder or risk themselves a little bit more on that um I almost I feel that in my experience almost everyone feels called to do that a little bit more to push the envelope a little bit more and to you know to really to really think outside of what they're supposed to think and 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 risk themselves on that so I, I find that across the board people always feel a little they always feel upset with themselves that they're not doing that more I, I find this very very uh, commonly so on some level, you know, the, the obvious, easy, feel good thing to say is that, yeah, I, I do hope with my work to, to kind of uh, push people in that direction to, you know, uh, make them feel encouraged or inspired to 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 do that themselves and to, and to stake out for themselves. Um, but in a way, that's the kind of the, the conformist answer that that's the feel good answer. I mean, on some level, I guess the, the antisocial or or like anti conformist answer here is that like to be perfectly honest, Brendan. I don't really care that much about my readers. Like I don't care about them. I'm just like, I care about myself. I care about my own mind. I'm obsessed with my own thoughts and I like, you know, I want power. I want influence. I want to build an audience. I want to like, you know, have fun reading and thinking creatively and provocatively. And it is kind of a single player game at the end of the day. I do think that I do think that thinking and writing is ultimately a single player game and it's somewhat sociopathic. It's somewhat, um, antisocial. And, um, I do think that that's kind of like the, the, the hardcore of, of, of these things. And, and yeah, I guess I try to be honest about that. Um, hopefully other people will, hopefully that helps other people in an indirect way though, I, mm -hmm. I would think. Well, whether you mean to or not, uh, in this conversation, you've, you've certainly done some of that for me and, uh, and I really appreciate you spending your time with me, Justin. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Brandon. I appreciate it. And yeah, stay in touch. Thanks for watching this episode. To help get more great guests on the show, be sure to subscribe.